<laughs> Good day, everyone, and welcome to the second um, meeting um, of the uh, GSA Acquisition Policy Federal Advisory Committee, also known as GAPFAC Industry Partnership Subcommittee meeting. Um, I am Stephanie Hardison, and it is my pleasure to serve as the deputy designated federal officer for this subcommittee, along with the designated federal officer, Boris uh, Aratia. Boris, a few words. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie, and, and welcome back. As some of us were meeting yesterday with the acquisition workforce uh, subcommittee, so good to see you back today. Uh, for all of you, um, great to be on our second meeting of the industry partnerships subcommittee today. So lots, lots to cover and um, we're looking forward to the discussions. So back to you, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, we would like to begin this meeting by thanking everyone for their time and participation. It is highly valued. Um, we would like to also thank all those who've helped bring this meeting together. Um, I would like to mention that this is a virtual public meeting. Today's event is being recorded and will be posted to our website with all relevant meeting materials. Uh, I would like to share with our public listeners and participants that there will be time for relevant comments or statements towards the end of the meeting. And for those who would like to provide comments, comments will be subject to time limits depending on the number of persons participating today. Um, if you would like to submit any written comments, please feel free to do so through regulation.gov. Um, we will now open the second meeting of the industry, in the industry partnerships uh, subcommittee by taking roll. Members of the sub subcommittee, I will call your name. If you could please take your uh, video off mute and say present or identify yourself. Um, Farad Ali. I think Farad, was Farad there? Yeah, he's a, there he is. Present, present, okay. present, <laughs> present, present. Kristen Siever? Present. Okay. Denise Bailey. Present. Gail Bassett. Present. Nicole Darnell. Present. Susan Lorenz Fisher. Mamie Mallory. Daryl McKissack. Stacy Smedley. Present. Uh, Nigel Stevens. Anish Talik, Keith Tillage, Dr. David Wagger, Dr. Kimberly Wise White. Present. Thank you. Yeah, I think and David I, is with us. Yeah, I'm present. Yeah. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. At this time, I'll now turn it over to the chairpersons, Siever and Ali. Thank you. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks again. I wanna thank everyone also for participating. I know it's a busy time of year and we all have a lot of things going on. Uh, pretty excited about today's agenda. Uh, I'd like to cover that real quick and then um, we're gonna turn it over to uh, some folks for some comments. But uh, so for our focus today, we've got some great speakers. Uh, I think that are really gonna help us with kind of direction and mission for our subcommittee. Um, from GSA and, F and FAS, so looking forward to that. Uh, we're gonna go back to the mission statement and also our areas of priorities and have some working time around that. Before we do that though, we will engage with our speakers in a, in a robust Q&A and discussion. Uh, we really wanna take advantage of their expertise being with us today. Uh, we'll have some time for public engagement and then we'll wrap it up and talk about um, you know, what's in store for the next meeting uh, after the holiday. Um, with that, let me see if, uh, Farad, you have any comments for the team? Um, no, I just really highly support and grateful that people are uh, active in this work. Um, I think we've got a lot of great work before us and our ability to align ourselves is gonna allow us to be really productive. So thank you all for participating. Thank you public for being here and, and looking forward to this meeting. Right, thanks for Rod. And then I think um, we have Troy and Cassius with us and I think uh, due to time constraints, we're gonna have them uh, speak to the group at the beginning of the meeting. Yeah. Uh, hi everybody, can you hear me? We can. Oh, great. Um, 
thanks, Kristen, for Rod, and, and thank you so much for your leadership with this subcommittee, and, and thanks to all the subcommittee members. Um, as I mentioned uh, at earlier subcommittee meetings, uh, Cassius and I are, are sitting in as observers on as many subcommittee meetings as we can. We are just really thrilled by uh, the terrific start out of the gate that all the subcommittees have gotten, and uh, we're looking forward to our next full committee meeting in January to um, uh, have the report out from all the different subcommittees. And um, and just real, we're just so impressed with, uh, first of all, everyone's enthusiasm and engagement and willingness to take on these very complex issues. Each and every one of our subcommittees really uh, potentially has so much ground it, it, it can cover. And so a big challenge uh, is to try to hone things in on areas where we can uh, be impactful and and uh, have recommendations that are actionable. And, and I think everyone's off to a terrific start. And so I uh, just wanted to thank you. I'm really looking forward to uh, listening in today. I, I think you've got Maria and Katie on the agenda. I can hardly wait to hear from them. And um, and then I will just also say, since we're uh, ho hopefully everyone's kind of headed in to get some rest at the end of the year, uh, happy holidays to all and look forward to a really great year next year. Yeah, Cassius, do you want to jump in with anything now? I don't see him present at this time. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Troy. Appreciate you getting on and addressing the group. Um, and so with that, I think without further ado, we're going to move into the formal part of our agenda. And Boris, I believe you were going to um, introduce our speakers. Yeah, thank, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Kristen. So our first speaker today is uh, my colleague, Maria Suebi. Uh, Maria is the Ombudsman in the Office of Acquisition Policy within the Office of Government-Wide Policy at GSA. So Maria's been around with GSA and uh, we've had a chance to work together on a number of things. Uh, she was around when the idea of this committee was being floated around well before Stephanie and I came on the scene. And so I consider her one of the masterminds behind uh, us being together as a committee actually. So there's a lot that she has to share, particularly for this group that's focusing on industry partnerships. Um, that's really a lot of, of her, her background and what she's been doing in the Office of Acquisition Policy. So without further ado, I turn it over to you, Maria. Thank you, Adam. Um, as as I'm sorry, not Adam Boris. Sorry. Um, yeah, so yeah, as uh, Boris said, I am the, the ombudsman. I've actually been in this role for only three years, uh, but I've been at GSA for almost thirteen. I was the uh, GSA suspension department official and agency protest official. Before that, and before that, I was in the private sector for a number of years and started up the um, government business sector and did the whole the, the the business and the legal side for actually Otis Elevator Company. So um, have a little bit of uh, uh, experience on the on the contractor side, which was actually very valuable when I came to GSA. Um, prior to that, I, I practiced in a um, in a large law firm. Um, and so let me just tell you a little bit. I, I wanted to give you a sense of the work that we do and then really end with some specific challenges that we have and where I see an opportunity for the gap fact to, to help. And so uh, let's just move to the next slide. And I, I, I say Office of Procurement Ombudsman, I go OPO for short, because that's just you know how we speak in government. We have an acronym for everything. And, and the word office is a misnomer. It's me and one other person. So we don't have an army of people as people tend to, to think, but um, we, we we're, I, I like to think we're small but mighty. And so this office was actually the brainchild of Jeff Kosis, uh, who in 2014, when he became the senior procurement executive and the chief, uh, the deputy chief acquisition officer, he, you know, knew and realized that in order for um, us to really do conduct our mission properly, we have to really start changing the culture and changing our thinking and really 
uh, starting to think of our um, industry partners as as true partners, not just the government dictating to its vendors or partners um, about what they should do. And and we use I, as in the last meeting we had a bit of conversation about partnership and what it meant, but I, I would just offer that, in my opinion, we use partnership for the name of this subcommittee in the very informal sense. It's not a, a formal agreement, a legal agreement, but it's more of an acknowledgement that we do need, need each other to actually be successful. And so when you see the word industry partnership in, in, in the subcommittee, it's, it's really that. It's just the idea of us, the government and the, the people that, the, that we do business with do, uh, working together um, to achieve um, our goals. And so um, the, the, the main reason why Jeff uh, uh, created this was to provide early intervention to resolve differences and reduce the likelihood of formal protest disputes and lawsuits because we're finding a, a lot of the, the, the litigation or disputes we got really stemmed from people not being able to talk to somebody. I mean, I have experience as a protest official and a lot of it was just, they couldn't get through to anybody else. So they felt they had no other choice but to form. And if we, we decided that if we had an avenue for contractors to come to before it got to that point, then we could prevent that. So that, that's one of the reasons. And then it, it involves a lot of collaboration within GSA itself, um, the services and the staff offices. And I'll show you a slide with our stakeholders after this, but, um, we also wanted to build the right relationships with our suppliers. And we use the word suppliers, vendors, contractors, partners uh, interchangeably when I'm talking here, but we, we wanted to be able to build, you know, not just build good relationships, but build relationships with the right, the right ones for GSA's business. And we also wanted to ensure equitable treatment of all parties participating in GSA's ac acquisition activities. I can tell you from even my former roles that the vast majority of contractors that are small businesses don't really know the ins or outs or have the resources to hire the lawyers or the consultants that to get them to navigate this federal marketplace and want to make sure that we don't have to require that you know somebody special or be able to afford a lawyer, be able to get your um, voices heard. And so that was also one of the roles that this uh, office was created to address. Um, next slide, please. So we have quite a few stakeholders and I've listed the ones that we work with um, mostly. Obviously GSA is, it, the, the, the agency itself is a stakeholder in this office. Because we deal with a lot of small businesses, you know, we, we also do a lot with um, SBA. We get a lot of complaints from small businesses who might have issues uh, with say one of GSA's uh, contracting vehicles and they sometimes come through the SBA as opposed to if they don't know directly where to go. Um, obviously industry or contractors, big stakeholders in this. Um, other federal government agencies who sometimes have issues navigating the GSA marketplace, um, they come to us also or sometimes they come to us on behalf of their vendors. And then obviously the Office of Federal Procurement Policy because they do set a lot of the policy um, that affects how we operate. And then within GSA, I work very closely with all of these offices and you're gonna hear from FAST today, the Federal Acquisition Service. Um, I'd also point out that you at some point hear from the Office of Small Business Utilization and the Public Building Service. And uh, I think those three arms interact with our industry partners the most on a practical day-to-day -day level because FAST and PBS do operational contracting and OSBU, um, you know, it's their mission to, to relate to and address the concerns of small businesses. So that just gives you a sense of the different offices within GSA that I work closely with um, all the time. And so next slide, please. All right, so what are the functions of the procurement ombudsman? And, and I always joke about this because it was a running joke back in, I, I'm originally from Jamaica and, and they used to do a skit on TV that says, if you're Jamaicans consider you lazy if you only just have one job. So in true Jamaican style, I don't just have one job, <laughs> I have three jobs. So the first one is, a, is a, you know, the fostering of the healthy relationships, which is, a, which is a procurement ombudsman. That's the original thought, you know, why this was created. and. Um, 
uh, the authority for that came from Jeff's uh, procurement executive authorities, uh, priorities, I'm sorry, which I didn't link them here just because they're internal documents. They kind of, the focus tends to change year by year, but building um, industry partnerships is always one of his priorities. So that stays the same, but that's sort of where the source came from. And then on the, the actual work we do, I, I, I talked about the first bullet already about providing early intercession. And that is the majority of where I spend my world is, is, is in this space um, because uh, that's people just need some place to go to. So, you know, we get complaints on every variety of issue that you could think about um, in terms of contracting. And pretty much what I found out, which was pretty much the same thing in the protest world, is that people just want to be heard. And, and if you take the time to actually talk to them and listen to them, a lot of the issues kind of go away. Because when I tracked some of the work that we did over the years, I found that the vast, regardless of what the specific issue is, a lot of it boiled down to just not being able to speak to somebody ultimately in the end. And so once they got to that, the issues got resolved. You know, the protests weren't filed, the lawsuits weren't filed. You know, the angry lawyers went away, the angry contractors went away because they felt heard. Even if they didn't get the outcome they wanted, they at least got heard, and that's and that's what what we do. And so um, we also conduct education awareness campaigns, and that's where I'm going to spend the rest of the conversation because that's where um, the gap pack I think comes out comes in. And then we um, we from the work that we do, we get a lot of recommendations and, and get insight into areas into which GSA can improve. So I shepherd those around the agency. Um, for, for people who are in positions to make changes to know that um, uh, these are issues that we are facing in our procurement system that need to be addressed or looked at. And then we also share lessons learned and best practices. A few years later, because Jeff being the visionary that he is, OFPP got that same vision that all the agencies need to have an industry, they call it industry liaison. So they kind of came up with this and said, we all had to have it, which I was, we're already doing the job. So if you look on that, some of the duties, they overlap with um, what I was, what this position was already doing. It's just that sometimes OFPP has specific tasks for each agency to carry out. So still have to do whatever they ask us to do under that industry liaison umbrella that might not necessarily fall into in line with what we already do. And the, the, uh, the third role that I play is as a task and delivery order ombudsman. For those not really familiar with the procurement world, you can't protest a task order unless it meets certain criteria. There's like a threshold, dollar threshold for DOD and civilian agencies, or it's a scope issue. And so that sort of leaves um, not much of an avenue for people who have certain complaints to, to on task orders to come. So we have this task and deliver order ombudsman rule where <clears throat> uh, you can file a complaint. It's pretty similar to a protest. It's it, it's really, but it's narrowed to a, one particular area is not given an opportunity to be heard. And so those complaints can be filed with me and I uh, hear and resolve them just like I would a protest and write a decision kind of similar like I would a protest. So that's the third role. But um, as I said, the vast, the vast majority of my world is in under the 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 green um, column here on the left, and it's bullets one, and then second um, amount of my time is spent on bullet two uh, in red there. And so let's let's go to that now that you get a sense of sort of the big picture. If we could do the next slide. And so, um, I, and I just came up with this name for education awareness campaigns. It's, it's whatever needs to be done to let people know <laughs> about new laws, regulations, executive orders, you know, rules, anything pertaining to acquisition that, you know, they have a wide, a GSA wide or federal government wide applicability, have high impact on GSA's contractor community. They have high, they're highly visible and or maybe controversial and are complicated and difficult to understand. So it's not like I take on, and it's impossible, I'm just one person or two people now, take on all of these issues. We just I pick the ones that are really, really high visibility because GSA and FAST and PBS, they're the experts at engaging with their 
industry partners and they do that as part of our culture. But when it comes to sort of these sort of complicated, more high level issues and get involved and we tend to do a coordinated effort so that we can make sure that our business partners um, understand what's going on. So what, what we do in the goal is to actually take these complicated laws, regulations, et cetera, and translate them into non-technical language that contractors can understand. If you can imagine, you, you have this combination of what I call lawyer speak, rulemaking speak, and government speak. And by government speak is we tend to string together a whole bunch of acronyms in one sentence and talk that way like it's normal and that people should understand. You know, we'll say the GSA gap fact subcommittee is meeting on the OFPP FAR rule. And, and like the average person just doesn't understand anything of that. So we, what I, I try to do, which is much, it's very difficult actually to take all this stuff. You have to take the, the and I work closely with, you know, the rule makers and to take that language, one, try myself to understand what it's saying. And if I don't understand it, we, we know already that it's very complicated and hard for the average contractor to understand, but try to understand and break it down in formats that, that we can communicate to contractors. And we, we do, that, I mean, it, do that in various formats. We sometimes have webinars, we sometimes have flyers with fact sheets and, and links to it. You know, we sometimes have Q and A questions. We have, have presentations, but we try to find a way to communicate that to our partners so they understand the importance of these um, laws, rules, regulation, what the impact is, and what's required of them, and when. And we also take a GSA um, specific view to that because we will also have to let um, our contractors know how we plan to implement these new requirements, whatever they may be, both on the policy side and on the operational contracting side. And so that's the value I think that we add that, um, that I, I think uh, contractors appreciate. Uh, and so I'm gonna just give you two examples of, of campaign, big campaigns that have run out of this office. If we could uh, move to the other slide. So the vaccine mandate, big deal, right? Everybody knows about that. The executive order that directed agencies and departments to implement the policy or mandating vaccination for contractors that do business with the government. This affected every federal co contractor and contractor employee in the US, right? It caused high anxiety in the contractor community. And it was an unprecedented use of, the, of acquisition policy in this manner. And so that you had, you can imagine during the pandemic, how that was contractors were scared that they were gonna lose their livelihood if they didn't get their contractors vaccinated. And so it caused quite a bit of turmoil. So it's, it's, some, it's, it's, it's things of this magnitude that I get involved and say, okay, how can we, and if you read the EO, it was also not very clear as to how it applied, how we'd applied. And so, this was a prime example of something we took that was high visibility, high anxiety, and um, and 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 turned it around in a way that we hoped educated uh, the contractor community and calmed them down a bit. And so the first thing I did was I actually gathered feedback, and I already had established relationships with industry associations, and then we also just had other contractors that we have contacts with on 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 this EO. What was what were their pain points? What did they think we needed to address? And and I fed that information, summary information of the analysis of that information back into the policymakers because they were making FAR rules, they were making um, GSAM policy, GSA policy off of that, so that they were informed as to what the concerns are when they are making or writing the rules. And um, and if you remember, this was a very different time. We didn't have time for the, the whole comment rulemaking period that, you know, we already have that, but that takes a long time. We wanted to at least get the information and put it out there to address as many concerns as we could in a very short period of time, because the between the time that the EO came out and the time for um, compliance was a very short, compressed period of time, so we had to do a lot in a short period of time. And so we conducted the webinars, we got GSA senior procurement executives to actually present um, from FAST, PBS, uh, Jeff himself, on, on what 
but broke it down, what it required so they can understand and how GSA would implement it. And then we had a live Q&A se section when they're all virtual. And we realized it just became so overwhelming because we had so many thousands, I mean, we had, we had to turn away people like crazy. The Zoom webinar could only hold 3,000 people because that's what we had the license for at the time. And, um, and there were so many questions. We actually had to, had to create a website to then be able to really communicate everything that we thought they needed to know. And it's still live and out there. Um, obviously changes have happened since then that make that mandate not as uh, relevant as uh, it used to be, but that, that sort of information is out there. So that, that's just an example of this kind of breadth and scope of education awareness that we, we engage in that have real practical sort of immediate term um, effects. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, and so we recognize that we can't have proper industry, uh, government industry engagement without the workforce also being involved, because part of what we're trying to do is to change culture. And, you know, one of the things that OFPP was trying to achieve with a series of myth busting memos that it put out years ago is that this belief that some government personnel have that interacting with industry engaging is actually not good. And so we're trying to educate and change that mindset. And so, you know, one of the things I noticed when I took this job was that, you know, everybody keeps talking about the workforce engaging, engaging, engaging with industry, but I saw no resources on effective engagement pro uh, practices that the workforce could use. There was no training on there. And so I thought, well, I'll fill the gap, I'll create a course. And that's what I did. I, I did all the research and found out what was there and what was not there. And pretty much all that was out there was a series of myth musting memos that uh, OFPP had put out. And I kind of called all of them and created a course from that material and from some other internal GSA material that I could find. And so that was a course I created for the GSA acquisition workforce was to educate them on the issue. And that was put on GSA's online university. So it's internal to GSA. And so when I told OFPP about that, they said, well, everybody needs to, to benefit from that, the entire federal government. So they tasked me with actually creating um, that for the entire federal workforce. But you know, as with many government mandates that come without funding, I had to just find a way to do it that didn't cost any money. And so one, I wrote and published an article in the FAI newsletter and to create a YouTube version of the same course that was on the G internal to GSA and put it on the FAI website. And that's you know, open to the entire federal government workforce and also available to the public. So we just, we have a education component both you know, with internal to GSA and external. And so um, that brings us to, I think our last slide. And this is, this is where, um, uh, I think the other one, the next slide. Yes. So this is where I want to talk to you about the challenges we have and just the opportunity for the subcommittee to help. So we are, of course, looking to increase business with small businesses, especially from underserved communities. And, you know, that derives from some of the pr priorities we have as GSA um, to to increase equity amongst other things and always small businesses at the forefront of of whatever we do and think about. And then, um, you know, we find that while that, that we have funding available for projects that advance climate goals, we don't really have a sense of what the key resources are to help communicate about climate and sustainability to this audience. I, you know, I, I have a lot of relationships with industry associations, but most industry associations are made up of large companies with resources to join those industry associations. But getting that community that we're trying to get, it's very hard to, to figure out, you know, I'll have some chambers of commerce here, but it, it, we, we really don't, re, we don't know how to communicate and reach that. And so that, that is a real challenge that we do have. And so we're thinking that if the subcommittee could, could help to curate some comp content to help companies that are generally unfamiliar with um, federal acquisition, 
uh, to understand key concepts in climate and sustainability. You know, refer back to how we have the legal speak, the rulemaking speak, the government speak. Now we have climate and sustainability speak. And we have to be able to find ways to actually communicate to our vendors um, what this is and what it means. And so assistance with doing that would be would be would be helpful. Um, we we want to also reach prospective contractors, new at market entrants. We need to help them to understand the requirements, to make the internal business case to pursue GSA opportunities and to evaluate costs. Um, and so if we can do that for sustainability, then we, we're having a model that we can replicate and use so on whatever topic. And so those, those are the things that I would leave you with as our challenges and opportunities that um, we would appreciate any input or recommendations you come out with um, in this respect. So with that, I stop and I turn it over to Katie or I don't know if Boris is gonna introduce Katie and then we'll do the Q&A after. Yeah, thank, thank you, Maria. And so to all of you, I will ask you to take some notes on what you just heard Maria say, hold your questions uh, because we wanna go ahead and bring Katie and then we're gonna do a Q&A, a joint Q&A session with Katie and uh, Maria. So please, please do take note of that. Thank you so much, Maria, appreciate it. So I wanna uh, welcome Katie Miller, who has been someone that I met through an internal GSA sustainable acquisition working group. So we started, they've been meeting for a while. So I joined this group and that's where I met Katie. And uh, one of the things about Katie, so she's a, the senior leader for climate uh, here in the Office of Policy and Compliance. Uh, she brings a lot of uh, background and knowledge in, in climate, but really has put a laser focus at the enterprise level uh, for how do we bring climate into the, the, the federal acquisition service business area. So but I'm really looking forward to Katie's remarks and, and I'll turn it over to you, Katie. Great, thanks so much, uh, Boris and Stephanie and, and the entire subcommittee today um, for having me here. Um, so as Boris mentioned, I'm the senior leader for climate for the federal acquisition service, or as we call it, FAS in GSA. Um, so my role is to lead climate and sustainability work for FAS and to create a foundation uh, for this work to progress into the future as well. Um, I'm relatively new to this role. I've just been here for about six months, but I've worked in different roles in the past at GSA. And like Maria, I've also worked um, on the private sector and had um, a consulting business of my own. Um, and I imagine you're gonna have lots of great questions after I'm done with my presentation. And, and I also imagine since I'm in a newer role here that I won't have all the answers, but I, I will go back to the team and FAS and respond to any unanswered questions for you as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, I, today I wanted to provide you with an overview of FAS, um, including our role within the agency and the government, where we're heading, and then how climate and sustainability factor into the organization. I also want to walk you through some examples of how FAS has engaged with industry on climate and sustainability initiatives over time. And then I'll discuss some of the key challenges um, that, if addressed, you know, could open the door to more climate and sustainability opportunities for us. So for the next slide, um, let's launch into the an overview of FAS. So on the next slide, um, the role of FAS is really to deliver a wide range of products and services to all federal agencies at the best value. And we focus on products and services that are related to technology, including um, IT products and services, motor vehicle management, um, including our fleet and zero emission vehicle offerings, which you're probably hearing about a lot in the news these days, uh, travel and transportation services, and then procurement and online acquisition tools. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in just a bit. So we go to the next slide. Um, one of the things our commissioner, Sunny Hashmi, has established for us are these FAST North Star goals. And these uh, three goals are really designed to ensure that we're orienting the organization um, towards the best outcomes for FAS, our customers, and our industry partners as well. So in all that we do, we want to ensure that we're adding tremendous value to our customers' mission, making sure that they find doing business with FAS um, really helps to boost them in meeting their mission requirements, uh, as well as enabling and supporting a thriving and innovative, compliant, resilient marketplace. So we want to build that marketplace for our industry partners um, that provides the type of solutions that our federal customers need for the long term. 
Um, and then finally, uh, we want to make it dead easy to do business with FADS. And while um, I think we think about that a lot from the customer side, we can also think about that from the industry partner side and that we want them to feel that it's easy to do business with us as well. So on the next slide, I wanted to chat a bit about you know, while we're focusing on those North Star goals, we're also focusing on how do we build a climate ready FAS. Um, so what does, what do I mean by climate ready? So um, climate ready means that we're proactively addressing climate change with two types of actions. The first is sustainability and greenhouse gas management. Um, and that's all about how do we reduce our impact on the environment by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, purchasing sustainable products and services and reducing waste. The second action area is on climate adaptation and risk management. And that area really focuses on, we know the climate is changing, how do we reduce a changing cli climate's um, impact on us as an organization? So these are things like increased wildfires, floods, droughts, extreme temperatures. And we really think about that in the sense of, you know, how do we try and reduce the number of breakdowns in our supply chain from the impacts of climate change? Um, and while those are two very distinct and different responses to climate change, they do impact one another. Um, so the more that we can really reduce our emissions and waste, the less we need to adapt to climate change. And, and why that's important is it's ad adapting to climate change is, is not cheap. Um, and the less money and resources that we and our industry partners can use, um, you know, the, the better. Um, so to build a climate ready FAS, we've really developed four key focus areas that you see here to address sustainability and climate risk. The first is managing and reducing our supply chain emissions. The second is looking at then also how do we manage and reduce climate related supply chain risks. Um, boosting sustainable and climate ready offerings. So we have some sustainable purchasing requirements and making sure that we're boosting um, those offerings to our customers. And then this final category I've called maximizing net zero economy offerings. Um, Executive order 14057 um, uh, has a goal for the federal agency to hit net zero emissions from procurement by 2050. Um, so maximizing net zero economy offerings is really thinking about how do we get ourselves, um, what types of products and services need, do we need to get us to that goal? Um, so next slide, um, I want to move now into some examples of how FAS has engaged with industry on climate and sustainability. I have seven examples I want to share with you today. And while this isn't an inclusive list, I wanted to give you a sense of the various flavors of engagement that we have utilized over time. And it's everything from tools, like you see on the screen right now, to information sharing, to encouraging suppliers, and then also offering them some direct support. So um, to start, I wanted to walk you through a couple of the tools. The first here is the Green Procurement Compilation, or as we call it, the GPC. So this tool actually started out of um, the White House Council on Environmental Quality back in 2007 or 2008 as a spreadsheet. And it was really born out of this need to help federal purchasers understand the various green or sustainable procurement requirements because it's, it was a point of confusion. Um, you, you see here now um, in its current online and much more modernized form than the Excel spreadsheet, um, our target audience has grown not just from the federal suppliers, but we now are also targeting sharing information with our vendors. Um, and you'll see that we have in that section online some foundational information for our suppliers here from basic information on what is climate and sustainability, what are the federal requirements, what's in the federal acquisition regulations, as well as some FAQs and resources for them. So on the next slide, um, the next tool I wanted to mention is the GSA Advantage Environmental Aisle. So GSA Advantage is the Federal Acquisition, uh, acquisition Services online purchasing tool for our customers. And this really provides that interface between federal purchasers and industry partners. And the environmental aisle is focused on, um, you know, helping our federal purchasers find the sustainable products and services and helping our industry partners market them to the federal government as well. I'm going to talk more about this one in the challenges section. And if you've been in other um, subcommittees, I have a feeling you've heard about some of the challenges that we've had with this as well. Um, so the next slide um, is another tool, this final tool online tool I wanted to share is a GSA Interact. 
So this is a forum for industry and government to communicate on various acquisition topics. And they have different communities there to learn about different acquisition topics. Some of them are specific to um, specific contracts like Alliant, um, and then others are general topic areas. I think there's an opportunity here because we do not have yet a climate and sustainability community. Um, so I think we could create one here and share more information on this um, with our industry partners. So next slide, moving, shifting a bit more into information sharing through um, some webinars that we've had. So this past year, FAS partnered with uh, the Environmental Protection Agency to deliver a three-part webinar series to provide some free training to our industry partners on federal policies um, related to greenhouse gas management, um, as well as uh, a, a series on completing a GHG inventory for industry partners, and then how do they start um, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions? So um, this is posted online on GSA's YouTube channel as well, and it's had um, more than 600 views so far. And then earlier this month, we also launched our first webinar in um, the Office of Policy and Compliance's um, Policy Landscapes webinar series. So this first webinar, we really covered the policymaking process and how industry can take part in that process. Uh, climate-related policy initiatives, and then cybersecurity policy initiatives as well. And so the goal really with this series is to support industry awareness of the existing and, and potential new requirements that are coming down the pike in different, different areas. On the next slide, um, so this is an example um, that where we we we're taking more of an encouragement approach here. So in 2015, and in conjunction with uh, President Obama signing Executive Order 13693, uh, GSA launched a pilot program with CDP, which uh, is formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. And in uh, 2015, we invited 120 suppliers to voluntarily disclose their greenhouse gas emissions through CDP. So this pilot has continued on since 2015. Um, and this past year in 2022, within FAS, um, we invited 184 of our top suppliers to report to CDP. Um, and some of the findings that we have from that is that of the suppliers who responded, this is a voluntary process. Um, so it's of those who chose to respond, 52% currently have greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets, and 62% have identified climate-related risks that could have a financial or strategic impact on their business. Um, and I wanted the image that I have here for you is, um, is a public page on uh, GSA's data what DTD website. Um, and this is the Federal Contractor Climate Action Scorecard. This is run by uh, the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings and the Office of Government Wide Policy. They pull this together every year um, based off of the CDP disclosure data that they pull. Um, but this is kind of where that information goes. You can get a snapshot of this. These are just the top 10, but this year it goes all the way down to the top 200 federal suppliers in regards of whether they're disclosing to CDP, um, if they have that information publicly available, and then um, climate risk disclosure, as well as their contracts um, in, a, in the previous fiscal year, how much that, um, they had in terms of obligations. So on the next slide, um, this, uh, this is a different approach that we took um, a while back where we took a very direct approach in supporting a subset of our suppliers to advance climate and sustainability. So in 2010, we launched this uh, greenhouse gas reporting uh, pilot for small businesses. And this followed the release of um, a set of recommendations that GSA was required to pull together um, for vendor and contractor emissions. So GSA was asked uh, through an executive order to investigate whether greenhouse gas emissions information could be used as a preference in the federal procurement process. And if so, how could that be accomplished? So the recommendations that came out of the report were generally, yes, but, and it, you know, because there was a lot more information and research we needed to do, um, there were some remaining questions. And we knew we really needed to take a phased approach because at this time, this was a very nascent space. So one of those questions was whether we could ask small businesses to report their greenhouse gas emissions. What would the impact be on them and what would the benefit be um, to them to do that? So we launched this pilot to help answer that question. Um, and so 
we actually brought on a contractor to directly support the small businesses um, in measuring, reporting, and reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. So 80 small businesses um, were invited to participate and 47 of them chose to participate in the process. Uh, one of the first things they were asked to do, um, their first tasks in working with that contractor was to conduct a base year GHG inventory for 2010. And uh, 35 of the 47 participants completed that. And what you'll see happened over time, the next year, as the next inventory was due, we only had 11 participants participate. And then the pilot ended up ending in 2012 because we had a significant decrease in participation. Um, so that's one, I just wanted to share one example where we really did do this direct support with some of our um, suppliers to see how we could help them. And then finally, um, on the next slide, um, I wanted to mention that we, we of course use the procurement process as a way to engage with industry on this topic area. Um, <laughs> so one of the ways that we do that is um, we're leveraging uh, FAST has an acquisition council or the FAC as we call it. Um, and the FAC reviews acquisitions at different phases of the acquisition process and offers feedback to the heads of contracting activities and acquisition teams. Um, and a collaborative effort really to produce successful procurement outcomes. Um, so right now through this process, we're reviewing large external government wide contracts. So we've defined that as $100 million or more um, inclusive of option years. And to review them to see, um, to ensure we're adding where we can greenhouse gas and climate risk reporting requirements, as well as making sure that the sustainable procurement um, requirements are also added to those where applicable as well. Um, second, you know, we can also use the, the plans that every agency are required to put out, um, the sustainability plans and the climate change risk management plans that agencies are required to put out. And this is one a requirement that was added to the GSA's climate change risk management plan. Um, it committed fast to ensuring that contracts in the areas where FAS identified the greatest climate risks are reviewed for um, climate risk requirements. So the top five um, risk, highest risk areas in terms of climate are telecommunications, motor vehicles and fleet, um, professional services, and primarily that's due to the reliance on telecommunications and IT, um, and IT hardware and IT services. Um, so the FAST Acquisition Council reviews those external facing acquisitions in those areas to ensure that climate risk is considered at the various phases of the acquisition life cycle. Um, and finally, we also collect feedback from industry on climate and sustainability requirements through um, draft requests for proposals. Um, and so one example of that right now, the OASIS Plus Draft uh, RFP is out for comment. Um, and it includes some pre and post award climate and sustainability requirements um, in the draft. And so um, that's open, I believe, through the end of this month for comment. Um, so that will also help us figure out, you know, the best way to shape these contracts with these requirements. And it's a way for us to have a, a, a bit of a conversation on this with industry. So next slide, I wanted to shift a little bit into the key challenges space. Um, so next slide, uh, the first challenge is prioritization. And here, I think this means a couple of things. And I think first, obviously, climate and sustainability are not a priority of every administration. So it's challenging to keep the steady line of progress moving forward, um, including ensuring that our suppliers understand the requirements as well as our acquisition workforce. You know, when you work in this kind of dynamic where it's on and off, it's very challenging to keep that knowledge building and growing. Um, so there's constantly this, there's this rebuilding of skills and people and information every time the pendulum kind of swings back to this being a priority. And that, that takes significant time to rebuild and can really kind of send us backwards very quickly. And it's very hard to regain that traction. Um, and second, I would say that there are also many other acquisition requirements beyond climate and sustainability, right? And so in a perfect world, we would mesh all of these requirements together um, and in practice, that's very challenging to do. Um, so um, that's another area kind of where prioritization becomes a bit of a challenge. Uh, next slide, another challenge for us really is the learning curve. So I think prioritization, you know, of course, plays a role in this um, for our suppliers because some of our suppliers are 
they're really savvy in the climate and sustainability space, but then some are not. So it takes a lot of resources, both on the government and industry side to kind of get this right and to build this learning curve and to build that understanding of what it means to add these requirements and how do we add these requirements to our contracts and, and what's the best way to do that in the acquisition process and in work, working with industry. Um, and, and you know, federal purchasers as well need to understand and know the requirements and, and industry needs to know them as well. So there's kind of like the pieces between we have the purchasers, we have the um, acquisition workforce, and then we have industry and, and trying to get them all up that learning curve together um, can be challenging. And next slide. Um, so what I, I mentioned this briefly earlier about um, the GS, GSA advantage and kind of the challenge that we have a challenge there with ensuring that we can properly identify our sustainable offerings on there. And this is something um, that's a challenge, <laughs> I would say, not just for GSA and the federal government, but even for um, commercial um, purchasing platforms as well. Um, but within GSA Advantage, how the compliant sustainable products are identified happen in one of two ways. Um, for some of the required environmental programs, um, they maintain a registry of compliant products and have the right data and information that we can make a match in our system in GSA Advantage to, um, to make sure the designations in there are correct for the green products that are available. Um, but then there are a lot of environmental programs who do not maintain a register, uh, a registry of information like this, or don't have the right data sets for us to connect to within Advantage, and the vendor is allowed to self-select their offering. So as you can imagine, this can create inaccurate listings on Advantage, and um, while we're utilizing some new tools to address this issue, um, this does continue to be an issue, and it's something that we're, we're actively thinking about and thinking about how can we move this forward um, over the next couple of years. And the next slide, finally, I would say, um, you know, defining the path to net zero procurement. I mentioned that that's one of our re the requirements in Executive Order 14057. And it just sets that goal of net zero emissions from procurement in the federal government by 2050. Um, and we don't really have a clear definition on what that means. Um, and Therefore, we also don't know exactly what's the path to get there. And this will definitely be just like with many other transformational changes, we need a kind of phased approach and we need to set some markers in the sand and figure out, you know, how do we do this? Where should we be targeting our efforts um, at various points in time as we move towards 2050? Um, and so we really need to get some definitions around that and have a plan on how we can get there and then how this goal meshes in with all the other climate and sustainability goals that we have in procurement to make sure we're all moving on a path together. And I would also say that a, a lot of times in this space too, we need to be flexible and we need to build an iterative process because we're constantly learning new information as we go along, as we do more research, as we try more things out and we pilot more things. So we definitely need to build an iterative process for this too, to make sure that we're really targeting towards net zero with the right actions. And final, and that's um, what I have for today. So thanks again for having me. I hope what I shared was helpful and I'll turn it back over to the subcommittee. Great, wow. Thank you both of you, Maria and Katie. We're going to um, have some Q&A and discussion with the subcommittee. Uh, hopefully you both have time to do that. I just wanna remind anyone on, uh, from the public, this is this session is the interaction part of the session is for the subcommittee with the speakers. Uh, we will have an opportunity for public input later on in the session um, as we go forward. So let me just, I'm trying to adjust my screen here. Um, and let me just start off with this was extremely helpful. And Maria, I think you said you were on the last meeting. So Thank you for listening and, and bringing some clarity uh, to our focus. I really appreciated both sessions and I know the subcommittee is gonna have a lot of questions. Um, you actually answered, both of you answered many of the questions I had going in, uh, like who else should we talk to? What are some of your major challenges? So I really appreciate, appreciate that. So what we'll do uh, for the team, we'll use the raise hand um, uh, feature in, Zoom so that we can uh, make sure we get everybody's voice heard. So I'm gonna open it up to the subcommittee at this point.
Let me go to gallery. Okay. And Kimberly, I see you've got your hand raised. Go ahead. Thank you, Kristen. Um, this is question is for Maria. Maria, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about kind of education and outreach, and you gave the example of kind of the vaccination status as an area that you guys focused in on. But I was wondering, since one of our missions as a subcommittee is really to look at climate and sustainability, do you all have priorities for climate and sustainability to kind of integrate for outreach and education? Because it would be helpful if there are specific areas that you guys are targeting from a training and outreach perspective that we make sure that we focus in on that. Yeah, uh, at least, uh, again, I'm only speaking from where I stand in the Office of Government Wide Policy, because um, FAS and PBS might have, you know, different priorities. I, again, I don't, I'm very narrow, I get narrowly involved in certain issues. So like with regards to your question on climate and sustainability, I'd get involved as a priority when there's a FAR rule that is on the horizon and about and about to come out or FAR rules and, and there are. And so, yes, yeah, so when those actually are um, about to come out, we, yes, I will get involved and we would have um, education and outreach on that. Being that climate and sustainability is um, a relatively new focus in this administration, meaning that it was a focus back in the prior Obama administration, kind of lost focus and we're back at it again. And um, so being that that's one of the things, and it's a, it's a specific niche area that requires expertise. It's not as if we actually, at least in the sphere that I operate in, in, in an office of government wide policy have that expertise. Um, and so we're trying, we're learning as we go and trying to, to build that. And so the FAR rule sort of has, it dictates a lot of where we go. So yes, the, the short answer is yes, we do plan to have some education and outreach when that happens. It's just that we always try to emphasize that GSA is just one member of the FAR council. And so we have to work in tandem with them. And, and we also, I just wanted the community to know that we we are subject to the FAR Council and OFPP. So GSA on its own can't just do stuff. So in order for us to do an outreach and education um, initiative or campaign on climate accessibility regarding a FAR rule, it has to have some specific GSA applicability that's different from like the rest of the federal government. That's how we sort of get our in and say, well, I, I understand that this is an OPP thing, it's federal government wide, but GSA is unique in that it has these you know, vehicles or it offers these particular services that are unique to our mission. So we have a right to, 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 to address it in that way. And so we, we, we just have to, we have to balance all the time. And I say this because it's important because I think it's come up in some other discussions. I maybe may have been the policy subcommittee that we have a line that we can't cross and this is this government you've got to have to you be def, def, deferential to fpp so when it comes to a far rule we cannot go out first and say anything about a far rule until and after that other stuff's coming i know it's a long answer to a short question but the answer is yes but i, I think it's just important for this group to understand the dynamics of how it works in the government with FAR rules and GSA's rule, mm -hmm. people confuse us a lot with, well, you're on the committee so you can make these decisions, but not like that, not that easy. No, I, I think that was really helpful. And, and I know there's lots of hands up. And so just a, a quick follow-up there. So I would assume because you can't take kind of proactive actions at a committee like ours, if we identify specific recommendations, then those recommendations would likely come to you guys potentially for some action in the future, potentially. Potentially, yes. yes. All right, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, wow. So yeah, that the far rule. A lot of hands went up there. Let me uh, let me go to Nicole, please. And then we'll go to Farad. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Really, really terrific, informative presentation. So thank you both, Maria and Katie. Katie, I had a uh, specific question related to the um, small business pilot program that you all ran related to greenhouse gas reporting. I think I, I suspect you're dead on with respect to this notion that um, when we think about small businesses and disadvantaged businesses, um, managing the climate uh, element is going to be a challenge. 
what struck me about how you characterize that pilot was that you reached out to 80 and at the end, the program was canceled because of lack of interest. So my question is twofold. What did you learn in that process first? And then second, what do you believe would have made this pilot program more successful that you might be able to take forward into the next iteration? Yeah, those are great questions. And I'll definitely get back to you with more information on that because I, I don't have that at the ready necessarily, but I, I did review one of the reports that, that came out of it. And I know that one of the challenges was just and kind of what Maria has talked about is like knowing who's the right person to ask the question to. Um, there was some confusion even over that, um, you know, we had the contractor that was supporting the small businesses, but then we had, you know, the FAS um, points of contact that were working with them as well on this. And sometimes they didn't know, who do I talk to? You know, who do I, you know, who do I ask this question to? Who do I submit my inventory to? And I think sometimes that became a little frustrating for them. I know that was just one, that was one of the points that was in that report that I remember um, scanning through and seeing that that was one of the issue areas, but I'll definitely look through that and I'm happy to get you some more information on that um, uh, shortly. That'd be great, thank you. Sure. Thanks. Farad, go ahead. Um, thank you all. Um, I, I can't express how much um, I really appreciate Maria and Katie you taking the time to do this. And I don't want to take up all the time because I have multiple questions, but um, I feel like I'm sitting in Congress and I only have the two minutes to make the presentation and, and you get a response. Um, it was interesting to hear from both of you all the challenges. Um, Katie, your challenges of uh, the, the shifting or the dynamics that may occur in Washington, D.C. and how that will affect priorities. And Maria, hearing from you, the interesting part of how um, having industry partners um, like Chambers of Commerce and other people as assets to support this work. So assuming that we're able to be successful, what would be success from this group um, that could be meaningful and helpful to both of you all? That would be really helpful as we go into our next iteration of work because I wanna make sure that we spend time doing things that could help accelerate or catalyze the work that you all are doing to make it easier. And that we don't find ourselves to becoming another data dump of information, but not being able to integrate it into the, the, the dialysis of opportunity inside of the federal government. And either one of you all can go first, pick one, draw straws, but I would like to hear if you mind, how can we be helpful? What, what, what outcome could we have that could be helpful in the work that you're doing? I'll go first. I mean, the first challenge I listed on there on the on the last slide says we have funding for uh, sustainability projects, right, and climate projects. We have difficulty reaching the underserved communities um, uh, to provide those opportunities and small businesses, not just underserved communities. So, and that's the difficulty we have just government-wide, right? No matter what the topic is. And then, then you narrow it down to an issue like climate and sustainability. It even becomes more difficult. And so you're talking about an issue that a lot of people don't understand, or if they understand it, they're not even aware of the federal government marketplace as a place <laughs> that they could enter, um, either because it's unattractive for whatever reason, or they just, they're just they they're just so successful commercially they don't even want to get into this space. So it, success to me is uh, actually even finding out who, who those are. We don't. We have no concept of, of, of what's out there in terms of a potential industry base for this particular topic. And we don't have any sense of, of, of that uh, large uh, pop, larger population, even a subset of that, that fall into the underserved communities that are, um, you know, outlined in the the racial equity EO of the present. So, so it's it's that would be success. Just being able to get a sense of who those people are, because we can't funnel anything in in those directions if we don't even know what what exists. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. That's a great that's a great pathway for us to go forth. And Katie, okay. for you too, as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I pull a little bit on those fast North Star goals, and you know 
how do we make this process dead easy, right, for our customers and our industry partners? That is, I think, the biggest challenge. Um, you know, it's, you know, as we've talked about, there's the learning curve on this, um, and there's lots of other requirements um, that are out there. And then we've kind of got layered in now that's like, now we need to be targeting for net zero procurement by 2050. So I think having a, like, a, what would be, um, you know, like what would be that the path of some concrete steps? We're taking some, you know, and we're trying to figure that out, but having all your great minds to kind of map out a kind of a path for us, you know, over time, what, how can we pull all of this together and how do we make it easy for our industry partners? I think, you know, when they're going in and they're trying to do their reps and certs and SAM, you know, it's, you know, they're, they're looking to kind of, how do I, I want to get this done. I want to be compliant. Um, but it's challenging to understand necessarily what all the requirements are in there, and especially for climate and sustainability. So I don't know if I've, I've created like a targeted answer for you, because I feel like we've got lots of, um, we've got lots of challenges, but like having some sort of path of recommendations of like, what, how do we, you know, take small bites at this and get to that target would be really helpful while helping our industry partners along the way. Hey, thank you both. Great, yeah. I had a few follow-up questions too. Oh, Anish, do you wanna go ahead? So like Chris uh, Yeah, I actually had a specific question for Katie on GSA Interact because that was one of the opportunities that you mentioned. Um, could you explain a little bit more how that works like what type of information is posted as like the initial I guess RFI or information that then it starts the conversation um and then how can this committee come up with um information or content that supports GSA Interact on climate yeah sure so um Interact is really it's really kind of like a a tool, I don't want to, I'm not sure trying to think of like what other kind of social media types of tools it might be aligned with, um, but it's basically kind of like a social media tool for industry and the government to talk to one another. Some, and there's all these various communities. So, you know, you can register to be part of one that's for like Alliant, or some of them are just for the GSA multiple award schedules, or, and you can register to be a part of any of those um, and to and the information that gets shared on there is anything from you know, hey, we've have, we've got this draft RFP out, or there here's an RFI that's out that we're looking for responses on. Um, to you know, we also posted about the webinar series that we just started um, earlier this December. So it really is just an information sharing tool. Um, some of the communities there's more of a two way conversation going. Um, Others, not as much, um, but I think with that tool, you know, thinking about, you know, I, I do think there is an opportunity there to create a community for climate and sustainability and there have to be like a kind of like a belly button for us to share this information with our industry partners and share resources with them too on how they can um, meet these requirements that we have out there. Right. So Katie, actually, I kind of have a follow-up to that point from your discussions on Interact. Um, it, it sounds like both of you probably engage with a lot of the industry government partnership associations. And so one question I have is, is there any sort of um, collective effort uh, engaging with those industry associations to kind of have some common effort around climate and sustainability that, that they then could disperse and work with their, their groups on? Yeah, so right now it's been a little bit more ad hoc. We don't have like a specific plan for that. Um, we did reach out to a lot of the industry associations when we launched the webinar series and, um, you know, to send out information on it and that, we, you know, here's where and when it is, here's a register share with your members. Um, and I think that really helped to increase um, attendance. We had over a thousand um, people register for it and we had over 500 attend, which I think is, you know, in today's day and age, in terms of those webinars, it's, uh, that's pretty good. Um, but we, we don't have yet like a coordinated effort to get that information out. And let, let me just add to that, Kristen. 
I don't think we have difficult, at least I know, I, I don't have difficulty reaching industry associations or even having their members. What you will find is the same people over and over and you're almost preaching to the choir because they understand this market space, whatever. Uh, what we have difficulty doing it, and, and there's always this protection of, you know, the industry association industry and, and, and the members, right? And so it's getting to the members who would actually participate in um, sort of an open way. Because one, one of the things you'll find, people are reluctant, especially if they're actual government contractors that actually have business or contracts with GSA, to reveal too much about a, what their particular company A is doing in this particular space. And we found that when we were doing Section 889 with the telecommunications, there's no one company that wants to come out there and say, oh, hey, you know what? I, I can't tell you if I have Chinese telecommunication systems in my right. top here. Why would I tell you that? So what they do is they put together a generic response representing the members of the association, and they submit that to GSA or the FAR Council or regulations.gov. But if you can understand agree, the yeah. difficulty of getting to I do. The I've, I've already gotten process. some of that feedback for sure. Yes. I was thinking yes. more along uh, of leveraging them as an amplifier if there was common curated content going out to all the industry associations to be sharing and educating the, their groups on. Uh, I was kind of thinking about it kind of that right. way. Um, well, we do. I think we do have it, um, it, but it's disjointed ad hoc, as Katie said. So I'll have my list of contacts fast. Has, you know, everybody kind of has, yeah, a, a thing. Right. <laughs> and, we'll, and, and they'll still... say, Look, can you give me your list? And you give me your, your, this list and that sort of stuff. That said, I would say that because of COVID, where we used to do things in person, what was great thing is we were to le leverage technology. What my office, the Ombudsman office does have is a subscription feature to hear news and events to get stuff out. So if you just if you subscribe to that, you can. And I think pretty much Interact serves the same purpose too. So I think if the short answer is yes, we actually do have an electronic means, but you still have to know that it exists and to subscribe to it, right? So that's yeah. also part of the hey. difficulty is getting people to, to know that. And it still tends to only reach a certain percent of the supplier based population, right? I think it can still leave out the folks we're having a challenge getting to um, in that mechanism. And then I have one other question, and I think David has a question. Um, so, one of the things we discussed, I think it was in the subcommittee meeting yesterday, was around this concept of, uh, and it really came out of cybersecurity, like the cybersecurity maturity models, because everybody was all over the place at the beginning and you had to kind of improve from wherever you are, meet companies where they are. And has there been any thought or discussion about creating something like that for climate and sustainability? And that would kind of unify, provide universal definitions and and toolkitting that uh, different folks could could lean on. And that might help with the pathway, Katie. Is there any discussions on that or? So um, I do talk with our cybersecurity group. We have a senior leader within the Office of Policy and Compliance um, who leads some of that work for FAS. And so I sit in on their, in some meetings and hear about what they're doing. And I've started to think about just kind of in the same vein of what you're saying, how do we take some of the, the successes that they've had and can we kind of import them into the climate and sustainability space? I know that they have been working on a uh, cybersecurity template um, for responses back from suppliers and uh, through the acquisition process. And so that's something that we've been thinking about too, doing for um, particularly for climate risk, because you know, in some of these contracts now, we're asking for um, climate risk management reports, right? And but we don't have a definition around that. And that doesn't help industry and it also doesn't help us because then we're not getting consistent and comparable information. So we're thinking that that could be the next level with that is the can we move to like a template where we gather specific information. And then over time, what that also tells us is 
where really are the biggest climate risks in different sectors um, as that information comes in through the acquisition process. Um, so no, we haven't gone down the path of the full-blown maturity model like uh, cybersecurity has, but um, that's definitely something we are trying to learn from. And I love the direction of your thinking there. I think that would be really helpful. Okay. All right, good, thanks. Um, David, did you wanna ask your question? Or do you want me to read it? I don't know if he's having. There's a question in the chat there from David Wagner. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. My, my buttons seem to be on lag. So it takes me five seconds to unmute. Um, uh, you know, Kristen, you almost asked the kind of question that, that I posed in the box is, you know, I'm thinking about what are the biggest opportunities? Do we know what the biggest opportunities and do we focus on those? You know, if from where I'm sitting, and again, this might be a very naive you know, perspective, but we don't have infinite time or infinite resources to try to achieve these reductions. We should try to, I think, identify where the biggest ones are and pursue those. Now, that is certainly gonna intersect with things like equity and bringing in disadvantaged businesses and small businesses into that, into that activity. But is that something you've all sort of uh, uh, at least um, have some con conceptual idea of where those are? Because I think, Kristen, your question was kind of in the same vein. And I think, Katie, you said cl climate risks. Uh, I don't know if it's climate risks as much as you know, where are the biggest emission reductions possible? And can we get at those relatively directly and quickly? And then who do we need to reach out to to do those, both sort of from the big side and the, the disadvantaged and small business side of it? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I that's something that we're looking into right now and conducting um, what you're talking about is like an environmental hotspots analysis and figuring out, you know, where are the biggest environmental hotspots in our supply chains. We did that, I think the last time back in 2014, we did an assessment. I cannot remember from the top of my head the way that sussed out, but we are looking into um, replicating that process within the next year again and getting some support to do that to figure out um, how things may have changed because it's a very different world um, from 2014 now. Uh, the, the hot spots might be in a different spot, but then we also want, we do also want to look at as well um, the, the climate risks and there's a climate vulnerability assessment that's currently being conducted for the agency, agency wide. And we also want to try and see, are there overlaps between those two areas? Um, you know, are there certain sectors or offerings where we have the biggest environmental impacts as well as the biggest climate risks? And could that be like how we target our efforts moving forward to prioritize where we can make the biggest impact? All right, got a couple more hands up here. Let me go um, back to Nicole and then we'll go to Kimberly. Yeah, I just have a quick follow up, Katie. You mentioned these climate risk management plans. It, it came up uh, in one of our other subcommittee meetings too. I'm encouraged to hear that you're thinking about a template, the possibility of a template for creating more transparency across the industry vendors who would be then engaging with this. I'm curious because I know you're still at the early stages with this and that's okay but you're observing things. And I'd be very curious to know what you're seeing. What are some of the hurdles that you're seeing here? What are some of the barriers? What are some of the issues that you're wrestling with as part of this process? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is kind of the, you know, it's that we're getting a lot of information in and for, and to, I just also wanna be um, transparent in that as we're just starting to add these requirements to our contracts, um, we don't, and there's like a phased in timeline for their post award requirements. So I believe the climate risk plan, I can't remember exactly for these, uh, these acquisitions, they're coming in a year or two after the acquisition starts. Um, so we don't have a ton of information at this point on, you know, what, what's come in. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge, I mean, we can look at it from GSA's perspective in terms of where we see the biggest climate risk as an agency, but then, you know, every agency also has their own climate, um, their, uh, we call ours our climate risk management plan, other agencies call them climate action plans typically, and they're all posted on sustainability.gov. Um, you know, and so what we're trying to do is to kind of create kind of within our contracts, blanket coverage for climate risk, I would say, kind of like that umbrella coverage, um, and then could allow agencies more at the task order level 
to if they have through their own process of identifying climate risk to identify specific um, ones that they want also addressed in the task order that they issue. Um, so I think, you know, I think we're still definitely figuring this out. I, I do think, and I'm hoping through the climate vulnerability assessment that's underway, that that can also help us kind of target more specific sectors and get a sense within those sectors, what are the biggest risks? And perhaps down the line, we could get to asking kind of, you know, beyond maybe, you know, next phase of the template, maybe beyond that is then for specific sectors, asking specific sector related climate risk questions. Um, so we can get some more detailed information and address those biggest risks that are happening there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Kimberly. And this question is for Katie too, actually right along the same vein that we've been talking about related to climate and GHG. I think Katie, earlier you mentioned that I think 184 or so of your um, vendors were voluntarily providing information on GHG emission reductions. And so I'm just wondering, is there anything that you guys have there that could help us to kind of leverage where, where you're seeing challenges, where there are commitments overall by your current vendors, where they're focusing their time and attention that may kind of give us a window of to where we might want to focus our recommendations to help you guys. So that's kind of the first question. And the second, just to get a an idea of the 184, like what percentage of that is your vendors? Like, is that like a large percent, a very small percent that are actually providing some information to you guys? Yeah, those are really great questions. So we invited 184 of our suppliers to um, report to CDP. And I, and I can't remember the exact number that actually did report to CDP, but it was not the full 184, but I can I will get that to you um, separately. And we are in the process of analyzing the information that came back in through there. I think what I provided on that slide, what I found really interesting was, um, you know, we did see about, I think it was about 50% were reporting, uh, were had emission, tar emission reduction targets, but I was really surprised to see that we had 60, I think it was 67% that had already identified climate risks. Um, uh, and I would have expected it to maybe be a little different because I see the climate risk space is, you know, it's not quite as advanced as the greenhouse gas mm -hmm. reduction space. But I also wonder if um, there's been that big push from the task force on climate related financial disclosures. And that's been a very investor driven and very private sector driven initiative. I wonder if that is having an impact um, and driving some more of the, the disclosures on that side versus um, the greenhouse gas side. But I will definitely check in and get you some more information on what we're finding from those disclosures. Great, thank you so much, appreciate it. Sure. All right, Farad, mm -hmm. I see you've got your hand up and then we may have to put some questions in writing just uh, in, uh, to save on some time here, but go ahead, Farad. Yeah, it won't be long. Um, I, and, and I think my question may have an answer that may need to be in writing. Um, I'm listening to you all insinuate uh, both of you around the requirements for people to be able to engage on the climate side. Um, we haven't really, and we did talk about underserved communities and their ability, their inability or ability to get access. But on the contract requirements, um, they said there's a phase in approach or there's opportunities. I mean, there's a gap between outreach and phase in approach and attaining the contract. Um, is that also perceived as a barrier? I mean, I see that as a barrier for diverse businesses or underserved businesses. And then how does that contract language allow for them to grow into it if they are not already in it? I'm sorry, could you say that part again about the, the phased approach and- I just Well, the, the phased it. approach meaning that, you know, you, you're saying you have this period of time to get, um, to be um, compliant, if I may say, but in, that compliant issue, is there a training that the government is providing to help them to be compliant? Is there cost mitigation? Well, like that whole process could be overwhelming. I was thinking about what Maria was saying. First, there's an awareness, but then you have this phase approach to, to including this, this kind of being compliant in this space. So where are these businesses getting this? And so having that document early on would be maybe helpful because that's also a barrier. That's what I'm hearing. I could be off, but that's what I'm hearing. 
Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying there. Um, we do have a, we have like a slip sheet that we've developed and I can share with you guys that we do share with the, the supplier community on this um, to help build some awareness um, on, you know, the greenhouse gas reporting requirements that we're adding, as well as the climate risk reporting requirements. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, um, and I, I hear what you're saying. Like, you know, we're, we're targeting mostly now with these larger $100 million plus contracts. They're we're focusing these requirements mostly on on the larger business community, not the small businesses, because we know that there's a you know there's a, a longer growing path usually for that. Um, but I I hear what you're saying. There you know we're we're putting these out right, and there's you know we're giving them a year or two to kind of meet these requirements, but that might not be enough for every uh, industry partner. And so I I definitely hear what you're saying, and I we definitely do have a need to. Um, you know, share more information that can help them reach those goals as well. May I offer that it sounds, um, Farad, uh, that you've identified a, a particular gap there, <laughs> but, you, you know, that maybe presents an avenue for, for, you know, your group to explore some more, because as I said, we need help in, in reaching that. So it, it sounds like you're kind of getting closer to identifying a gap that could be filled. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Kristen, back to you. <laughs> no, we hope we're getting closer, Maria. We hope we are. But I want to I want to thank the speakers. I do think there'll be some more questions if it's OK with you. would love to submit those back to you in writing and and potentially have you back back on for another um, session. Uh, for discussion, particularly as we um, narrow our scope, maybe and and move forward. Uh, but really just, I found this incredibly uh, valuable. Uh, so thank you for your time. And I know we went over, so thank you for being so gracious with your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So for, for the subcommittee, um, our next area of focus, and we do want to allot time for uh, public input, but I think we have some time to talk about the mission and the key priority discussion. And um, I think what I'll do is I think I'm going to move um, Adam. I think we'll go right into the priorities and just get 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 a first look focus on that, if that's OK. Um, and if we have time, we'll call up the mission. But I think we need to digest some of what we heard today um, as we go forward. So for the subcommittee, we're going to kind of have an interactive session here. So. Um, it's probably going to be easier. I can't see any hands when this is up. So I think people can just come off mute and speak up. But what we wanted to do was two things. One, the, these are the areas of focus that we put together way back at the beginning. Um, and based on some of the discussions we've been having and some of the other subcommittees, there could be new ideas based on what we're learning and what you've heard from some of these presentations and what you're thinking about. So if we have any new ideas for a card, uh, we can talk about that today and Adam can help us populate it in one of these uh, green cards. The other thing we wanted to try and do was say, hey, are some of these kind of the same or related or kind of close to each other? And we could start to group them and he can help us drag them over there. And then there might be some that we don't even want to address anymore that we may think is just way out there or too much or whatever we feel. And we can leave those off to the side. So um, I guess what I'd like to do is just have some interaction from the subcommittee um, before we do some affinity, is there anything, did, have you, any of you thought about something that wasn't on the list that really we should put on our priority list based on what we've heard over the last couple of meetings? And, and Kristen, what, I, what I'd add to the instructions, if, if you do think of something, drop it in the chat and David okay. and my team will copy and paste and create the sticky. Uh, into this virtual whiteboard. So that's the only other thing. So if you, if you got something right now, definitely drop it on the chat and David will create the stickies to put on the whiteboard. So this is Kimberly here. I guess just one thing to add, it came out of some of the conversation today in one of our last subcommittee discussions is most of our stickies are really focused on kind of small businesses, not necessarily underserved or minority businesses, except for maybe sticky number 10. And so I think we had talked about kind of incorporating 
like in number one and probably number 10, not only small businesses, but those minority or underrepresented businesses so that there was a path for them to hopefully be successful and understand what entry looked like into the DSA model. So it, where we where we set where there was a lot of small kind of broaden that definition. Am I hearing you correctly there? Yeah, that that's what I'm thinking. I I think I've heard it mentioned on this call, like I said, in one of our other subcommittee calls, that we've been talking about it more collectively, not just small businesses, but also, like I said, the minority businesses. And we kind of call out in number ten, like women-owned businesses. But I think we were actually being a little bit more broader than that. Okay, so I, I think we can take a note for the file. Um, what I'm hearing is where we say small businesses, um, there's there's government categorizations of key businesses that they want to target and that seem to be the same businesses, um, like Maria talked about, that are harder to reach and get a feeling or understanding um, how well acclim acclimated they are to this challenge of climate and sustainability. So we could go back and kind of populate that into each of the cards. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, where those are. And then we can clean those up and we can, um, we can then, um, we can affinitize those. I, I added this one. I mean, one thing I heard loud and clear was, um, you know, this need and it really is, you know, in the eye of the beholder, you know, what is the negative space out there of lack of knowledge and understanding of these key attributes to support climate and sustainability? And you know, how do we potentially help with that? Um, I'm just reading the comments as we go. Yeah, I was thinking what David is saying too. You know, I think the NWBE captures, you know, some okay. of we need to make sure we 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 capture it because there may be some lack of understanding in the whole community. But what I heard from Maria was that particularly in those other communities, it's like lack of awareness and knowledge as well to even be able to be competitive, recognizing this is coming down the pipe. I mean, when you look at the the system, it seems like there's no knowledge, there's no implementation there. And if you do get in, you have a period of time to make it work. So anyway. Yeah, no, and I heard from her too, that they don't know, like there's like kind of like this desert, you know, uh, government doesn't even know who to go out and try and target um, in this in this marketplace relative to climate and sustainability. So it's, there's challenges all around for sure. How about um, some of these, I think, are kind of related. Um, so can we kind of do a cluster exercise here? Um, I'm just taking a look here. And some we don't have to pull in. But so I think. So can, can I ask a question here? Sure. So on our. On the block in B, help educate industry on climate and sustainability. And maybe that's a really short thing for a very broad category. It's one thing just to kind of talk about them generally, but it is this really intended to be if you want to be competitive in the in the government services and goods provision space, you need to pay attention to this. Is that really what that means? Which which block? I'm sorry. No, David. the one the, the, the one says help educate. So there's the education about the importance of these two attributes to be competitive in the government sort of contracting space? Is that what that means? Or is it more broad general education? No, I think to... it's more on, on the on the contractual requirements that are currently in place and those that might potentially be put in place. That if... it, it, it occurs to me, and this is maybe a bad analogy, but you know, sports teams, when they when they bring on someone, you know, they they they, they uh I guess they um they acquire, they they hire somebody to be on their team. Sometimes they go to a farm team. They don't immediately go to the shows, as they say in baseball. They're doing something. Is there any kind of sort of work to get, sort of work your way up into it, like an on ramp that that 
you're kind of there, but you're working your way to get qualified that rather than going in cold, it's kind of a, a bridge. I mean, maybe, maybe I missed that and there is such a program. I'm just wondering if, if that's a way to, to, to grow it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't think there is a scaled kind of entry credit, scaled credit. I mean, I guess everything in government procurement comes down to the evaluation of the submissions, right? So do you get scaled credit depending on how big or small you are, uh, where you fall on some sort of scale? But I don't even know if that scale exists. Um, but I like to go back to um, just the access to information for small and minority businesses. I think that that resonated throughout both of the presentations. And as I look at, you know, like number 10, how do we incentivize larger, larger entities to partner with small and minority businesses? It sounds like, you know, doing, um, where was it? How do we empower the right businesses and look for those who truly want to grow in offering sustainable products and services? We first have to identify those businesses who are in this area of sustainability and climate. And it sounds like that uh, Maria is having a challenge identifying their small and minority businesses in this area. So, and it's kind of, I'm kind of off, I'm kind of talking off subject in a way, but I'm trying to address her challenge. Because one of her main challenges was the larger businesses, they have access, they have opportunities, I mean, all, all of the above that are barriers to small and minority businesses, access to capital, access to opportunity, access to information. So first, we really have to identify those businesses who can grow in this area and then identify how do we help them um, sustain in this area. Because, they, because a lot of those small and minority businesses are not aware of this climate and sustainability industry because they are so small, they are only responding to what's in front of them. And this climate and sustainability may not be in front of them right now. So if we're right. going to open the door for you know, more opportunities for them, we have to give them more information that this exists. Because I challenge you to say that most and, and I work with small and minority businesses all the time, they may not even be aware that this exists within the GSA or this kind of conversation is going on now. So I think we need to step back a little bit and help to identify those businesses, even if they're not in this area, maybe they're in one area of transportation, but it hasn't morphed into their businesses for climate and sustainability, but it can. I'm hoping I'm making some sense here. You are, and I just want to clarify something because I've heard this a couple of times and I want to make sure maybe I, I might be thinking about some of this wrong is that, you know, there's all sorts of types of businesses that can do business with the government. And I think what I'm hearing is that the government is now saying that in order to do business with us, you've got to be able to bring these certain type of capabilities to the table. And so that's what, we really want to educate uh, or we want to make sure that the supplier pool fully understands that and there seems to be a gap in that understanding and access and ability um, in the small owned business the underserved communities because you know the largest are there um, so I think that so it's not like that they're in the su sustainability business. It's that they have to run their business in a sustainable way. Absolutely and, right, and they don't right, know what the, and they right. don't even know that this requirement could exist. So they are always playing behind the eight ball here, and the, and and then by the time that it comes to be, you know, by the time that they are aware of it, the competition, so to speak may not, you know, may be more difficult for them to, you know, get in the game, so to speak. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's all about access to information. Early, early, early access to information. I like that. Adam, can you throw that in a green card? You know, access to information um, and then knowing what to do with that information, right? To drive your business. 
Um, and then I know we're running on time. So, and we're going to stay with this because I think it's important for us to really kind of figure out what it is we want to do. Um, and I see the comments uh, from uh, everyone that um, on the small business, I agree. And that was 10 years ago, that survey they did with the small businesses, you know, that's a, it's a huge population. Um, so, you know, maybe it's about how do we how do we shine a light, a beacon, a, a, a place that, that it makes it easy for small, these uh, businesses to find information, get help, that type of thing um, as we go forward. Okay, I'm just reading some of these cards. Um, Okay. Uh, um, I think we're going to run out of time here. So, but hopefully if, as we start to think of it this way, if we can start to, you guys have the numbers here, you know, you can, we can interact and just, uh, if we can affinitize, get rid of some of these, and then, then we can figure out how to fine tune this into an area of focus uh, from these speakers. Access to information. So this whole concept of access to information um, is key. And the other thing I kind of heard is against what scale? Um, that seems to be undefined. If we're just gonna use the FAR rule and then whatever the next proposed FAR rule, you know, how does that create a pathway? But that's a different subject for a different day. Hey, Kristen, we quoted the number three red. There was a comment here that maybe that might be one. So I think the ones that are questionable here for you all that, you know, we can quickly change those to red just to, just to flag those that might be outside the scope. But just to clarify, that's what we yeah. meant. Yeah, okay, yeah. So like for me, like number nine is kind of fading as far as importance given that we're focusing and I don't want to speak for the team, but you know, we're really starting to hone in on this knowledge gap, access to information pathway. So I don't, if you guys feel there's some others we can kind of put off to the side, that would be great. Um, you know, one other comment, I didn't have a chance to ask them about it, but you know, when they say they're targeting the $100 million contracts, which is good, but all of those bigs are also going to be required to have a pretty substantial small business component. So if we don't bring the small um, uh, businesses, the other businesses along, you know, we're still going to kind of cannibalize the supplier pool. So I think we're on to something as far as creating a broader pathway uh, for those folks. So, because those same requirements are going to trickle down to those smaller minority businesses. That's right, right. And you want that, and that's where some of that discussion was. We want that to be real relationship building, right? So that those small businesses can grow and thrive. Um, not just you know, like check off a contractual item on a box for the large, right? And I think that's because in the end that doesn't help it doesn't help the supplier pool and it certainly doesn't help the planet. So we want to be able to do that. Okay, let me, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna pause off here because we do need to, uh, I do wanna make sure that we offer some time for any public input um, that we may have out there. So Adam, when you get it, yeah, thank you. So do we wanna also spend time to get questions from people outside? This will yeah, for public, public attendees, yep. Yep, we have two hands up. Okay, so I see a Josh Jacobs. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Josh Jacobs, Director of Sustainability at WAP Sustainability. Um, don't know if you need this to introduce who we are, but just figured I'd cover my base. Um, I have one question and then a comment, if you don't mind. Uh, Miss Miller, are you still on? I, I think I saw you. I have a question for you specifically, if that's okay. Yes, I am still on. Oh, hey. Hi. hi there. Awesome. Love the blue background. Um, so you. in there in the CDP project where you invited 184 people, 
Did the information you guys gathered here help fill in the background justification and information for the proposed federal supplier climate risk and resilient proposed rule? Because it seems like it's perfect, right? You're, you're 52 percent, 62 percent, right? It, it, did that help fill in some of the justification there? So that activity is separate from the the proposed FAR rule. And unfortunately, because of the dynamics, I can't comment on the proposed okay. FAR rule right now. Yeah, yeah, understandable. Okay, just if, if it's completely separate, awesome justification, well, I'll put it in our proposed comments. Um, one, my one other comment though was for Ms. Miller and Ms. Swaby, you both mentioned that not getting suppliers to tell you certain things. Right, um, was a was out of some Ms. Swabi mentioned, you know, fear of, of, of um, you know, seeming separate from the group. Uh, Ms. Miller, you had mentioned, you know, what emissions of concerns and where specifically to go after the money that's been aside for EPDs and low carbon material in the Inflation Reduction Act is going to actually help a lot of this, right? Because you're going to be able to see the information. Suppliers aren't going to be able to hide information per se, especially about global warming potential and environmental impact. So you're going to have a mechanism to get past some of that automatically just due to the, the procurement requirements of the Inflation Reduction Act and the EPD requirements that are coming out now. And I know GSA is already using that for concrete and uh, uh, certain products now. So um, hopefully some of that will be will be answered shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your input and for attending today. Appreciate it. We have a professor, Steve Scooter, on the line. <laughs> so as a non-subcommittee member, I appreciate being recognized very briefly. And I think this is mostly for Katie and for Maria. Uh, I love the fact that you both spoke about outreach and learning curves and understanding that GSA and our committee can't interfere with the rulemaking process. I guess I was wondering what GSA is hoping to do or what we might be able to do to help the private sector be ready if, in fact, we ever do have a mandate for GHG assessment, disclosure, and targeting. And I'm reminded that, let's be clear, that is simply not going to be dead easy. So that's part one. Number two, I was curious, and I think this is mostly for Katie, if you see potential in um, testimonials, pilots, case studies, examples. And what I'm really thinking about is if you could find a few of the big primes who are engaged in the SBTI, the Science Based Targets Initiative, and they could tell their story, that might be the kind of things where others start worrying about competitive advantage and they might be inclined to say, oh, I need to get on that train. So I'd be curious, any thoughts on either of those? Yeah, so I can't answer any questions about preparing the supplier base for uh, a proposed rule, um, unfortunately. Um, but I think, you know, I we have definitely talked about, um, you know, in terms of like, as we do these educational webinars and um, that perhaps we could bring in a supplier who has um, you know, been doing a GHG inventory to talk about their process. And so kind of like building on what you said as well, like, you know, what the SBTI process and how that has um, helped them as well. I think that's a great idea. Kind of hearing it from one of their own rather than hearing it from us always helps. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, thank you. And um, any other input or comment from public participants? Okay. So what I'd like to do, Stephanie, just to kind of close out is, um, if it's all right, I would like to just, you know, for, for us as a subcommittee, I think we were starting to get some traction around coalescing around some things. So I'd ask you to really be thinking about that. We'll try and have, um, we have one more public meeting before the full committee meeting. So that will be on the 4th, I believe of January. We do have an administrative meeting scheduled for next week. That's more so I can keep it on the calendar and make sure we get ready for the public meeting. If any of you can join that, that's more of a kind of working session, just an organization, but completely understand with the holidays and everything um, that we want to uh, be focused. So at our next meeting, though, we'll really begin to focus on what is the output required for the full committee 
uh, and how do we pull ourselves together and understanding we'll be reporting out uh, where we are at this point in time. Um, on the prioritization of Boris, I just want to, and Stephanie, we'll be able to capture these in the chat um, and have them available. And so we can work behind the scenes on that grid and then maybe send out some iterations on that for people to weigh in on, just being conscious of people's time. Yeah, we, we can totally do that, uh, Kristen. So we'll capture uh, what's on the chat here, as well as the uh, work that we did on the mural board, and then we'll send those iterations out. We'll send them to you first. Okay. And, yeah. You and Farad, then you guys can pass them okay. back to the, to the group. Okay, very good. And um, I certainly, um, I do want to thank uh, you and Stephanie and uh, Adam for uh, using the whiteboard with us. I'm hoping we can use some more of that collaboration type tool to get engagement as, as we move forward and we start to solutionize a little bit. So let me go to Farad to see if there's any comments no, no, no. and then we'll open it up. Yeah, Kristen, I think we've gotten further. We continue to make real trailblazing headroads through this process. Um, I'm excited about where we're going and having this kind of discussions. Wanted to hear from the group, how do they feel about having speakers um, to help give us guidance on and going forward? Because again, this is a democracy and we appreciate having um, others um, attending the meeting to help give us um, their comments and guidance. So um, how do you all feel about having these kind of speakers as we go forth? This is Kimberly here. I definitely appreciate having the speakers because it gives us a window into where they focus their time and attention, where they've seen some challenges and opportunities. And so it helps us, I think, hone in and prioritize where we might want to focus our recommendations. So I, I definitely appreciate the, the speakers that we've had so far. Thank you. Yeah, and I think what we thought of was, you know, the first several will be to help us get focused, right? Give us information. And then as we begin to prioritize where we want to go, we really want to target speakers that can help us in that more narrowly focused area we decide to focus, decide to go forward with. That being said, uh, I do appreciate we did have one entry into the speaker list. So whoever entered that, I appreciate you uh, getting online and putting that in. Be thinking about other folks we might want to hear from and uh, please put that on the Google Doc, share Doc, so that we can uh, take a look at to see if we can get those speakers in for the meetings we have. Looks Anything? like we're giving back five minutes of time, Chris. That's a, that's a good thing, right? Oh, I hope so. But um, <laughs> I really just appreciate everybody. Let me just open it up for any any closing comments from anybody on the subcommittee. Okay, Stephanie, now you right. got the mic. All right, this will conclude the second industry partnership uh, subcommittee meeting. The next virtual industry partnership subcommittee meeting will be held um, January the 4th from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, Boris, would you like to make any closing remarks? Yeah, a couple of them. Yeah, I'm just uh, learning every time I say on one of these, I, wow, there's, a, and I've been at GSA for a while, but this was a really extremely, information rich meeting. So I think our heads are spinning here with a lot of information, but good stuff. Um, I want to say Stephanie and I are reaching out to the Office of Small Business at GSA. I think that's another key partner. And I've heard a lot about small business in this conversation today. So we want to bring in, not, no promises yet, but we're definitely looking for the right people from the Office of Small Business, because this is the kind of stuff they think about all the time. Uh, and then also wanted to invite anybody who's not on the policy and practice uh, subcommittee to join in tomorrow. If, if you're not able to uh, get the, we have a 5 p.m. cutoff for registration, but you can just send me an email and I'll send you the link. Uh, and you're, you're more than welcome to join in as an observer if you're not on that subcommittee. Uh, but lots going on. And um, I think um, you'll have a lot. And, and we'll definitely be working with you, Chris, into curating consolidate all this in, but uh, for you all. But uh, yeah, I do want to wish you a, a happy holidays if I don't see you at the admin meeting. So thank, thank you for staying with us and uh, appreciate your, your time today. Yes, happy holidays to everyone. Holidays. Thank you so much. So again, we would uh, like to thank you all for your engagement and involvement. And at this time, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.